He is at the crux of an apocalyptic vision of salvation and slaughter that millions of people share. 40 or 50 percent of Americans say they believe in key elements of the end time scenario, which includes the rise of the Antichrist. He is the central figure in the world's most popular doomsday prophecy, and some say they know his profile. If you're looking for the Antichrist, you look for somebody who's very attractive, very articulate, brilliant, um, someone who would know many languages. Above all, he represents a paradox. The Antichrist is pure evil, but true believers look for his coming with anticipation. The Antichrist is going to be an agent of destruction, of death, of worldwide catastrophe. And yet, in the apocalyptic communities, nothing is more looked forward to with jubilation and expectation than the emergence of this Antichrist. Whether fact or fiction, his role is clear. The Antichrist is Satan's human emissary on Earth. And some say signs of his work and presence are all around us. I believe that the Antichrist is very much alive right now in Europe somewhere. As you look at the Bible and you look at the news, it goes hand in hand. And to me, it's absolutely amazing. Ready or not, here he comes. But who is he? The Antichrist or a mass delusion? The end of the world. For many of us, it's overwhelming. Something we hope is far off on the horizon, beyond the scope of our lives. For others, the end may be more concrete. A growing fear that a catastrophic event, perhaps a nuclear war, will make the planet uninhabitable. But there is another group of tens of millions of Americans for whom signs of the Antichrist and the end of time are welcome. That's because they indicate the second coming of their God. These Christians share a very specific, prophetic, apocalyptic vision of the end that begins with a miracle called the rapture. In an instant, those who are true followers of Jesus Christ, what the Bible says, are born again, will be raptured, will be caught away into the heavens to meet Jesus in the air and will be taken to heaven. Imagine a, a huge percentage of the world just disappearing. If true believers disappear right out of their cars, their cars are going to crash. The planes are going to crash and boats are going to sink. You've got chaos. Once the rapture happens, the worst period in human history happens. The rapture sets the stage for the Antichrist, who will appear as a savior and stabilize a world in turmoil. But ultimately, those left behind will be subject to unimaginable horrors. People melting and their eyes melting and their you know, faces being destroyed and, and them splitting up. That's in the prophecies. It's not going to be a pretty end to time. We are on a timeline of history. The world did begin. The world as we know it will end, and there will be a transition. This agonizing transition is known to believers as the tribulation. It's part of a system of biblical interpretation called dispensationalism, favored by some evangelicals and fundamentalists. According to this schema, there will be a seven-year period that culminates in unspeakable suffering, which will be dominated by Christ's evil opponent, the Antichrist. Starting in the 1830s all the way up to the present time, there's been a rather consistent teaching about the Antichrist. They believe that this would be a personification of evil, a kind of messiah of Satan, who would gain power at the end of the present historical age. He's unifying the world. There'll be sort of a one world government and a one world currency and, and uh, a one world religion and uh, God would then pour out horrible judgments on the earth against Antichrist, against his followers, and millions upon millions would be destroyed. 
there would be attempts to destroy Israel. The Battle of Armageddon would be an attempt. There's imagery there of the Valley of Megiddo filling to the height of a horse's bridle with blood for thousands of square miles. How close are we to this horrific vision of butchery and justice? Too close for comfort, according to those who believe the end is near. It just seems like we're hurtling headlong towards something. Are we closer to the end than any of us really thought? Can such dire prophecies be true or even partly true? Are they divinely inspired or fantasies that create their own unholy trail of terror and death? True or false, the roots of the Antichrist go all the way back to the beginning of recorded religion. The Christian notion of the Antichrist builds on the scriptures, which build on Assyrian and Akkadian texts from the region of modern Iraq at, at the time of Babylon. Uh, the great story is of Tiamat, the wicked, powerful serpent of the deeps. Like Satan, Tiamat rebels against the higher gods, but is defeated by Marduk, the patron deity of the city of Babylon. After slaying Tiamat, Marduk creates the universe out of sections of her body, a good whole made from evil parts. And hence, we have the creation of order, the beginning of civilization. Other ancient religions had this same kind of blending of good and evil in their central characters. The god Pele is responsible for the volcano, but of course in Polynesia the volcano has some positive aspects. And so you get one god who becomes in charge of two things. American Indian cultures commonly uh, uh, speak of balances of things, uh, that uh, the same fire that uh, warms you can burn your hand. The Hindu goddess Kali is a particularly stark example of a god with a mixed nature. She has four arms, and two of them are holding, you might say, instruments of death. And the other hand on the bottom is a hand that is open like this, which means I'm giving you boons. She's the mistress of death and destruction and the giver of life and compassion. What we have is a fused uh, dynamic where many qualities are united in one figure, unlike what we're familiar with in the West, where it's all divided up. Some scholars believe it took the transition to monotheism to polarize good and evil. According to one view, key elements of this shift occurred around 600 BC in Persia, modern-day Iran, with the new religion called Zoroastrianism. And it would one day lead to the God versus Satan, Christ versus Antichrist opposition found in Christianity. That divided the world into good and evil, like a big cosmic boxing match. The prophet Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra, declared that a single benevolent god known as Ahura Mazda reigned supreme. As soon as you establish that there is pure good, pure light, where has the darkness gone? It didn't disappear. According to Zoroaster, there was another force in the universe. He articulated the evil forces within the world as Angra Manu. And Angra Manu is attributed with all of the troublesome creatures within the world that can bring us plague and pestilence. Could Angra Mainyu be the precursor of the Antichrist? Scholars point out that Zoroaster articulated an end time scenario that's similar to what would appear in Christianity, a final showdown between good and evil. This supernatural end time battle is the central drama of the Antichrist. There's a distinction that's rather fresh and that's rather new, where there becomes this notion that all that is good is associated with God, and all that is bad is associated with the devil. Some scholars believe Zoroastrianism influenced Judaism and, ultimately, Christianity. After the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians in 586 BC, thousands of Jews were deported to Mesopotamia. When the Persians conquered Babylonia in 539 BC, the exiled Jews were exposed to the heightened drama of new religions. The beast, 
the dragon of chaos, the betrayer. Such were the metaphors that ancient societies used to make sense of evil. Or were they literal manifestations of an evil figure? Either way, they set the scene for a new archetype of evil in the end times drama, an antichrist whom believers would soon find stalking across the pages of the book of Daniel. But does this text really refer to the Antichrist or to a historical figure who walked the earth more than 2,000 years ago? Apocalypse. The word conjures images of the end of the world. Chaos. Mass destruction. final cataclysmic showdown between Christ and the Antichrist. But such associations are surprisingly different from the original Greek meaning of apocalypse, which is simply to reveal. And of course, we mean this unveiling or revealing God's plans for the ultimate end of our world, for punishing the wicked, for rewarding the righteous. Many apocalyptic texts were written between the second century BC and the second century AD, during a period of persecution of Jews and subsequently Christians, and some have become part of the Bible. To prove the existence of the Antichrist, prophecy believers often turn to the Hebrew Bible and the apocalyptic writings in the book of Daniel. The word Antichrist never actually appears in the book of Daniel, but the book does refer to a despotic prince who is to come during a time of turmoil. The world will be in turmoil, and the world will be looking for one significant leader that will draw the world together under the banner of peace and safety. He will bring prosperity to the world. He will uh, affect the economies of the world in a positive way. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. A biblical week, according to believers, is equal to seven calendar years. What really triggers the seven-year period of tribulation is the agreement that the Antichrist negotiates with Israel. It's a peace treaty for seven years. In the middle of the week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Three and a half years into that, he will break that treaty. He shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods. His ultimate characteristic is pride. He believes he's better than God. He believes he's higher than God. He deserves to be enthroned. But is the book of Daniel truly prophetic of the Antichrist and the end time scenario? Or is there, as many historians contend, something else behind these references to a despotic ruler who usurps the divine order. According to some scholars, the book of Daniel was written between 167 and 164 BC, during the persecution of the Jews under the Seleucid Syrian emperor Antiochus IV. These scholars believe that references to what others see as the Antichrist are actually directed at this Syrian despot. Antiochus IV, and in the course of taking control of Jerusalem, begins to take certain measures to try to solidify his hold on the Jewish population of Judea. And as resistance against him builds, he ultimately declares himself to be a god and demands worship of himself in the Jerusalem temple. The Hellenized Seleucids had controlled Judea on and off after Alexander the Great's empire was divided up at his death in 323 BC. Heavily influenced by Greek culture, Antiochus came to power in 175 BC with the intention of Hellenizing the Jews. In 167 BC, Jews who refused to submit to Antiochus started a war known as the Maccabean Revolt. It's a perfect time to start expressing yourself with apocalyptic literature because you can sort of hide what you're saying under the symbols, and yet uh, people who read it, who are living in the time, they know who you're talking about when you're talking about this evil king. In Daniel 7, Daniel has a vision 
in which he sees the various mythological beasts coming up out of the sea. And these represent the different empires that had afflicted Judea. The beast, of course, is another name for the Antichrist, a tradition that begins here in the book of Daniel. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. But this beast, many scholars say, is metaphorical, a veiled reference to the immediate oppressors of the Jews. That it has iron teeth, which signifies that it's, uh, it's identified with the Greeks, who were always identified with iron in the ancient world. It has 10 horns that represent the succession of monarchs in the Seleucid Syrian Empire. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. The horn had eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And this, of course, is Antiochus IV, portrayed as a braggart, portrayed as a little horn, and portrayed as subject to divine destruction. In Daniel's vision, God intervenes. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. And then it then portrays the rest of the vision as an ultimate destruction of the king of the north, the Seleucid Syrian king, that in fact does not correspond to what we know happened historically. Judah the Maccabee did defeat Antiochus. But it's here that Daniel's scenario diverges from history. Many of Daniel's details concerning the defeat are inaccurate. And some scholars feel the book must have been finished before victory was complete in December of 164 BC. They point out, however, that Daniel's apocalypse still performs the traditional functions of such a text. We get the three main notions. First of all, a portrayal of the persecution felt by this community. Second, a promise that those responsible for this persecution will be punished. And third, that there will be an exaltation of those who remain faithful. Prophecy believers dispute this historical reading of Daniel. Hundreds of prophecies from the Old Testament that foretold the coming of Jesus physically as a baby in Bethlehem were fulfilled literally. So we're saying, why wouldn't the New Testament prophecies and some of the Old Testament prophecies about the second coming and the Antichrist and all that also be fulfilled literally? But academics claim prophecy isn't the point of apocalyptic literature. Well, apocalyptic literature is really not written to tell you the future. That may sound a little shocking. People read apocalyptic literature in order to try to understand their present situation, why things are not going right for the right people. Is the book of Daniel history or prophecy? Is it encouragement to the oppressed Jews of the second century BC or the work of a visionary about the end of time? The debate is typical of the controversy that swirls around many of the Bible's apocalyptic texts. And nowhere is that controversy more heated than in the New Testament's Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation comes to us across millennia, a text teeming with bizarre images of sea beasts and seven-headed monsters. You'll have beasts in the Revelation of John and the mystic numbers and various fantastical creatures and all the rest of it, dreams and visions. As in the book of Daniel, the word Antichrist never actually appears in Revelation. In fact, Antichrist only shows up five times in the entire Bible, in two epistles traditionally ascribed to John the Apostle, but probably written by his disciples. But for those seeking prophecy, Revelation represents God's most forceful communication about the Antichrist and the end times. Like the book of Daniel, some of the strongest imagery in Revelation has to do with a beast. 
one whose real identity, believers say, is the Antichrist. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies. He's going to be charismatic. He's going to be well-liked. He's going to be persuasive. He's going to be spiritual. He's going to be insightful. And he will encourage everybody with hope. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Surely the world would hail him and honor him and respect him and at the end worship him. No one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of his name, 666. He is going to require people to receive that number, and what I think it is is a prefix that is added to their individual number. For instance, my social security number. While believers see the Antichrist in such passages, Many scholars argue that Revelation is not so much about the future as the past. And it can only be understood in historical context. It is believed that Revelation, the last book of the Christian Bible, was written during the first century reign of the Roman Emperor Domitian. It's no longer the community of Jews, but the community of Christians who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire. So if something is to happen in society, say uh, an earthquake, a famine, uh, economic failure, whatever, uh, it was very easy for someone in society then to blame it upon the Christians. They saw the Antichrist everywhere in the culture. They saw the Antichrist telling them in order to serve in the Roman army, you had to literally worship the statue of the emperor. Deliverance, meanwhile, was not forthcoming. New Testament texts like Thessalonians had prophesied that Christ would return within the lifetime of first century readers. Those prophecies were not fulfilled. It's now two generations since the death of Jesus and the end hasn't come. The Antichrist helps explain why the end hasn't come. There's still demonic forces at work. It is in this context of perplexity and doubt about the second coming of Jesus the John of Patmos wrote the book of Revelation around 95 AD. Exiled on the Greek island of Patmos for preaching the gospel, John addressed Revelation to seven Christian churches in Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up from out of the sea. And we find out that one of the administrators of Satan's work here on Earth is the beast from the sea. And of course, the, the Hebrew people never became seafaring people. They were a land-based culture. Anything that came from across the sea was foreign, and it was suspicious. It was usually evil. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. It points specifically to the Roman emperor Nero, uh, who was believed to have committed suicide and who is then identified with this head that has this wound. Nero, of course, is a very notorious figure in the Greco-Roman world. Nero's wound was self-inflicted. He stabbed himself to death in the neck in 68 AD. But four years earlier, he gleefully embraced the Antichrist role, nailing Christians to crosses, feeding them to lions, and burning them at night in his gardens. Nero blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome and tied people to poles and poured oil over them and used them as lighting and just terrible things that he did. So powerful and terrifying was Nero that some believed he would rise Christ-like from the dead. There is a trajectory of understanding this text that Nero would return as Jesus Christ was expected to return. More than implicating just Nero, scholars argue that many passages in Revelation are also primarily about Rome. John uses three primary symbols to bring out what is really wrong or evil about Roman society as he sees it. And the first one, uh, the sea beast. This portrays the coercive power of military and political might, which was bearing down upon the Christians at the time. 
Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. The second form of evil that he sees is when religion is used in support of the evil state. And he uses this as the earth beast. And this would be also referred to later in the, in the, the book as the false prophet. So it's religion used in a false sense. If you're being asked to go into the town square and put uh, incense on a little altar and say, Hail to God Caesar, but you don't believe that Caesar is a god, you've got a real problem there. No one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name, 666. And then the third form of evil is economic seduction, which obviously that can place a tremendous amount of coercive power upon people. That if you didn't go along with Rome, then you couldn't buy or sell. On some of the official Roman documentation, there may have been imperial slogans that were necessary for doing commerce in antiquity. The number of the beast, 666. Scholars today believe that that's the numeric value for the name Nero Caesar in Greek. Clearly, it's possible to read Revelation as an indictment of Roman power, or more prophetically, as evidence of a coming Antichrist. But is there another way to interpret this text? I think Revelation could be understood as presenting us with a deep symbolic contrast between good and evil within ourselves. That is, these kinds of symbols live and ask us to question how good and evil relates to our own activities. What it does tell us is that often in history, the good people have bad things happen to them. But faith says that the right eventually triumphs. But not, apparently, without innumerable victories for evil along the way. Through the Middle Ages and beyond, sightings of and crusades against the Antichrist would lead to the slaughter of countless innocents. The word Antichrist has been used throughout history to demonize everyone from popes to presidents to pop stars. It has been a rallying cry and a death knell. triggering passions both deadly and divine. And yet, Antichrist, perhaps the most highly charged word in the Christian lexicon, is buried in the Bible, where it appears in minor passages just a handful of times. Probably coming as a surprise to most people, the word Antichrist only appears in about the two most obscure books that you can find in the Bible, 1 John and 2 John, two very short letters. According to scholars, these letters or epistles were written near the end of the first century AD. During this period, Christians were fighting fiercely among themselves about whether Jesus, the Son of God, had actually existed in the flesh. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. And he defines them in terms of those who deny the uh, humanity of Jesus. Uh, so we can see this writing is against the backdrop of the developing Gnostic version of Christianity. Gnosticism was a religious and philosophical movement that threatened to splinter early Christianity. The epistles of John portray those who do not accept Jesus as the Son of God or as somehow a human form as somehow representing false doctrine and therefore representing an antichrist figure. But how could the antichrist sentiment in the epistles of John morph into an absolute evil flesh and blood antichrist? Think of the emerging figure of antichrist as a kind of magnet which attracts disparate texts and figures to gradually coalesce into a full-blown legend, which in itself is not present in the scriptures. As Christians came to get a greater and greater sense of who Jesus was as God on earth, the contrast, that is the final human enemy, also becomes clearer and develops as the kind of shadow side, perhaps. 
In the form of a man appeared the Savior, and in the form of a man will the other also come. For the first time, a flesh and blood portrait of an Antichrist emerges. But this passage isn't from Daniel, Revelation, or the epistles of John. It was written in 202 AD by Hippolytus, a prolific theologian of the early Christian church. In his treatise on Christ and Antichrist, Hippolytus brings together ideas about the Antichrist that were prevalent in the early church, including a belief that would serve as a pretext for much bloodshed through the centuries, that the Antichrist, like Christ himself, would be of Jewish origin from the Hebrew tribe of Dan. That element, that is the Antichrist as a Jew, that was accepted by the Jews, was one of the elements certainly that was present in much of the pogroms and persecutions of the Jews in later history. During the Crusades, the Antichrist's name would be invoked to stir hatred against both Muslims and Jews. I think the most destructive uses of the Antichrist legend in the course of history have been when Christians have identified the outsiders as, if not Antichrist, at least Antichrist's predecessors, Antichrist's army, etc. This has been evident in persecution of the Jews at numerous times. It's especially evident, of course, in the conflict between Christianity and Islam. In the First Crusade, launched by Pope Urban II in 1095, Mobs of peasants, the People's Crusade, devastated Jewish settlements along the Rhine. In the conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, there was wholesale slaughter of Muslims and Jews in the city. The apocalyptic element in the Crusades became very, very important. Perhaps even more powerful after the city of Jerusalem is recaptured by the Muslims in the year 1187. The Muslim general Saladin's recapture of Jerusalem in 1187 led to arguments that he was the Antichrist. Interestingly, Muslims also have an Antichrist figure called the Dajjal, who first appeared around the 9th century in the Hadith, a collection of the Prophet Muhammad's sayings and stories of his daily life. The notion of the one who's not really a Christ, but trying to give an image of being a leader, of, of being a messiah. So the word Dajjal itself, of course, means a deceiver in Arabic, or a, a blatant liar, and it's someone who's a false messiah. And this notion is also found, of course, in, in the biblical text. So there is this distinct notion that the idea of Dajjal is directly linked to this idea of the Antichrist. During the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, the word Antichrist was even used by Christian against Christian. Reformers found it incumbent upon themselves to justify their break with Catholicism. No easier way was that than to look at the Pope as the feared Antichrist. And for what it's worth, the Pope returned the favor and began to name each of the Protestant reformers as agents of the Antichrist on earth. The power of naming the Antichrist proved to be highly seductive, especially as a form of prophecy. In the middle of the 16th century, Nostradamus, the famous French physician and seer, wrote enigmatic verses that interpreters say identify three Antichrists. The most famous of Nostradamus' quatrains about Napoleon is Century 8, Quatrain 1. And it says, Pau ne Laurent will be more of fire than of the blood. Pau, Ney, Laurent are three small towns in southwestern France. And if you just simply move them around a little bit, they spell quite accurately, Napoleon. Hitler was the second Antichrist. He's referred to as Hister, which is an old word for the Danube River. Although that may sound impressive, most critics caution that Nostradamus' prophecies are so hazy that they're bound to find a plausible fit as the centuries roll by. Like the quatrain in which Nostradamus identifies the third Antichrist as an evil figure named Mabus. Creative interpreters of the quatrain have claimed that the last Antichrist is everyone from Saddam Hussein to Russian President Vladimir Putin. 
uh, there's been a giant tale throughout history of what I call pinning the tail on the Antichrist. <laughs> and whatever needs to be identified at that moment as the worldly threat for which we rally the troops and have uh, unquestioning opposition to, Antichrist can take that image. But there is a dominant image of the Antichrist today, that of a slick man of peace with an agenda from hell. Some Christians contend this image can be found in the Bible, and they've been turning it into publishing gold for decades. But who is this Antichrist really? A man, a myth, a monster? And what does he want with us? The story of the Antichrist has grown chapter by chapter, century by century. His identity, forged from ancient myth and highly symbolic biblical passages, has proven so durable that the name Antichrist has been on the lips of warring factions, oppressed peoples, and political rivals for centuries. To anticipate who and what a future Antichrist might be, you have only to look at what he has been. Will Antichrist be an external enemy, or is he an internal enemy in the church or even within ourselves? Will Antichrist be one, or will Antichrist be many? Will Antichrist be a terrible persecutor that we should dread, or is he fundamentally a religious deceiver? In a sense, Antichrist is all of these things and uh, each of them in various proportions as you sketch the history of the legend over 2,000 years. Whoever or whatever he is, belief in the Antichrist and end times prophecy is cresting once again. There's something in the air that people are fascinated with apocalyptic events and with a sense that, there's, that real evil is rising and this clash between good and evil may be reaching a cataclysmic moment. Though he has always been known and feared in apocalyptic circles, the mass media has given the Antichrist unprecedented renown. Every generation has thought they were the last generation. And so the difference is in this generation, we have global television networks and we have global distribution of novels that promote those ideas. So now when we have an idea, we, especially Christians in America, can distribute those ideas worldwide instantly. Indeed, the Antichrist made one of his biggest incursions into the mainstream with the publication in 1970 of a slim volume that popularized a fundamentalist and evangelical version of the end of the world. Probably the individual who most needs to be singled out is Hal Lindsey. His epical, The Late Great Planet Earth, first published in 1970, has gone through edition after edition. I think this text, more than any other, has popularized a fairly common set of expectations and fears related to the notion of the Antichrist. He's going to be attractive. He's going to be brilliant. He's going to have supernatural intelligence and supernatural powers. He will be one of the first in history to truly be a world leader. I mean, control the world. Blessed are the peacemakers, the Bible famously says, but Lindsay helped popularize the notion that peacemaking will be the ultimate cover of the Antichrist. It's by bringing what appears to be peace that he brings them all under his spell. Christian writers Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye took up Hal Lindsey's mantle with a vengeance. They've written a series of novels about the coming of the Antichrist that has sold an astounding 62 million copies since 1995. It's the best-selling adult fiction series ever. And here we are, you know, evangelical writers writing for a Christian publisher with an overtly evangelical story. Although presented as fiction, the core material in the Left Behind series has become a realistic portrait for many Christians of both the second coming of Christ and the reign of his nemesis, the Antichrist. In the Left Behind series, the Antichrist will be the head of the United Nations, a popular, peace-promising, charismatic leader from Romania 
who uh, gets control of the United Nations and then moves it to the new Babylon in Iraq, where he begins to oversee a new world order. Fictional specifics like the UN and Romania aside, the Left Behind series is in sync with a widely shared view of the Antichrist and his mission. He's going to use all the modern speak. We love everybody, everybody's good, everybody's okay, let's all join together and be one. And the average man and woman are going to look at him and say, this guy is a great guy. Antichrist would actually bring about a peace treaty in the Middle East, and the Jews would rejoice. They would rebuild their temple in Jerusalem and experience a new revival of Jewish hegemony and security and peace in the Middle East. At that point, according to the dispensationalist plotline, exactly three and a half years into his reign, the Antichrist will bear his fangs. He doesn't try to pretend to be a nice guy anymore. He just rules the world with an iron fist. He would enter the new temple in Jerusalem, declare himself to be God, and demand worship, and put to death all those who refuse to acknowledge him. Receive his mark, the mark of the beast, on their forehead or hands. And he lets go a horrible holocaust against them. What modern dispensationalists say uh, would be the worst persecution in the history of the Jewish people. Jesus, when he returns, he comes as a rescue operation. Because if he didn't come at the moment he's going to come, there'd be no one left alive. So it's at the second coming of Christ, at the end of this tribulation, that Antichrist is defeated. His forces are defeated. Um, the surviving Jews receive Jesus as their Messiah finally, and Jesus sets up David's throne in Jerusalem. Not surprisingly, this elaborate scenario isn't for everyone. It's a frankly supernatural worldview, so that rather than try to understand our own involvement in events or the ambiguities of life, it's all understood in absolute good versus evil terms. But if the apocalyptic texts aren't literal prophecy, what meaningful messages can they continue to convey? I think it also does answer to something very deep in the human condition, which is the attempt to make sense out of history and to find ourselves on the side of good in the midst of so much conflict. There is a whole dimension within ourselves, often that we're not even aware of. A shadow side that is filled with anger and revenge and all sorts of uh, dark motives that we are often loath to acknowledge. And I think the invitation is always present to ask the question, what is the Antichrist within myself? What is the evil within? Determining whether the Antichrist is physically real, some kind of metaphysical energy, or entirely delusional, may ultimately be beyond our knowing. But what we can grasp is that the Antichrist looms ever larger on our horizon, his footfalls growing closer with each passing decade. Antichrist. Tens of millions of people are on the lookout for him and for signs of the end times. When a person with this set of beliefs opens a newspaper, they are in a sense looking for the possibility that the Antichrist could appear there. There are a lot of people who believe, yes, the Antichrist is alive and prepared now to take his place in the sequence of events leading up to the end of time, as predicted in the book of Revelation. You look at the fact that Europe is uniting. Uh, you look at the fact of Israel today being a nation that is in need of peace. 
All these things make us believe that possibly the Antichrist is alive. Whether believers think he's here or merely waiting in the wings, they consider the Antichrist an agent of unparalleled evil. He is the one who will be possessed by Satan himself. And he will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. And he's seen as a sign of the times. We are living in apocalyptic times. Global warming and that rising nuclear threat among nations that really scare us. The whole Middle East quagmire and jihad and all these kinds of things. These are not easy times to live in. Many prophecy believers feel the end game has already begun. The focus that the world has now on the rise of the Antichrist and the return of Christ, I believe the board is set and the pieces are about to move. The Antichrist has topped most wanted lists for the last two millennia. Prophecy believers have never stopped hunting for this figure, Christ's evil opponent, Satan's human representative on Earth during the end times. He is both dreaded and, oddly enough, welcome. There's hope in the figure of the Antichrist as well because it signals the end of the world, which signals a reunion with Jesus Christ and a perfected humanity. If you read the New Testament uh, literally, like the conservative fundamentalist Christians would, the order will be the Antichrist will arise and, and have a seven-year reign. Christ will return and defeat the Antichrist and then initiate a thousand years of godliness on the earth. Prophecy believers fear that the tribulation, the Antichrist's seven-year reign on earth, will culminate in a period of unspeakable punishment for humankind. A great war will erupt that will bring the end, that will cause millions to perish. Worse, much worse than the Second World War that killed millions. This will kill millions more. In a very short time, half the population of the Earth is killed. So it's no wonder that some Christians have been tracking this demonic figure across history. Believers have constructed his profile using clues scattered throughout the Bible, but found primarily in the Old Testament book of Daniel and the New Testament book of Revelation. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Daniel chapter 7 predicts that the man will have a spellbinding ability of oratory. It'll be through his tremendous speaking ability that he will mesmerize the world. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. He's going to be a political figure. He's going to bring peace at first. Uh, he's also going to be an ecclesiastical figure because he does supplant the, the religions of the world with his own. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders. The Antichrist will read scripture, he'll quote scripture, and he will do signs and wonders and miracles. For prophecy believers, the Antichrist is an arch criminal who stands accused in advance of his crime. According to scholars, he's been hunted with particular vigor in America. Some believe this American preoccupation is founded on fear. The Antichrist has been a figure that has represented fear of a changing world, a world that will change to the detriment of Christians. Few historical events have created change and stirred up millennial thinking like the discovery of the new world. In the Great Commission of Matthew 28, all of the world must be evangelized before the return of Christ. So if you note in 16th century Mexico, when they discover the new world, a rise in apocalyptic thought comes back because now we can evangelize the whole world because we finally discovered it. In the 17th century, the Puritans came to the New World for economic and religious freedom. 
but also to convert indigenous peoples to Christianity. And yet within weeks of arriving on American soil, they were beginning to starve and they needed to begin to raid the food storages of the Indians. And it was only a few weeks later that battles broke out and it led to the mass murder of Native Americans. There was no easier way to justify this persecution and to begin to see the Native Americans as agents of the Antichrist, to see that they were demons in the shape of Indians. Once the object of the settlers' evangelical interest, the Indians were now suspect. The problem for the old world in meeting the Indians is that we were the Antichrist. The Bible had been used to rationalize the existence of all people in all lands. So if we were descendants of Adam, then why was there no mention of us in the book? In the 18th century, the Antichrist label would spread to the enemy abroad. During the period of the American Revolution, some patriotic ministers thought that perhaps George III was uh, the Antichrist. You really find allusions to the Antichrist from the very beginnings of American history. The word Antichrist is used to describe anyone's enemy through the centuries, and it's very often used to dehumanize them and make it possible to, uh, to fight them and fight them to the death if necessary. From Nero to Napoleon, dictators and despots have always been magnets for those watching out for the Antichrist. In 20th century America, prophecy believers set their sights on Europe, based on a long-standing fear of a despot who would head up a revived Roman Empire. There will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, and as iron breaks things into pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. For two decades in the 20th century, many were certain that this prophecy had been fulfilled. Among fundamentalist Christians, there were a tremendous amount of fear about Benito Mussolini as the possible Antichrist. Why? Because he had revived the Roman Empire, as Antichrist was thought to be going to do. But even at the height of his infamy, Mussolini had competition. Among many attributes, Hitler's skill for oratory was seen by some as a sign of the Antichrist. <laughs> Daniel chapter 7 predicts this person as having a great mouth, speaking great things. Revelation chapter 13 says it again. Adolf Hitler literally spellbound the Germans. I believe that he was demon-possessed. One of the amazing things about prophecy belief is its ability to survive counter-evidence. When Mussolini was killed, when, when Hitler died, uh, writers who for, in some cases, uh, 20 years, in the case of Mussolini, had been identifying him firmly as the Antichrist, simply sort of said, well, oh, never mind, <laughs> and offered a new scenario. Prophecy believers have often turned their attention to U.S. presidents in their search for the Antichrist. For them, this passage from Revelation predicts an antichrist who will use economic coercion to dominate the world. No one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. His number is 666. During the New Deal period, there were certainly prophecy popularizers who saw uh, Roosevelt as the sort of uh, puppeteer, the demonic master. When the Social Security Act was passed in 1935, they said, aha, now we see the true nature of this, of this demonic system because we're all going to be given numbers just the way the Bible foretells. Decades later, the number of the beast, 666, led some to seek the Antichrist in a president who was himself religious and interested in biblical end times prophecy. And one of the arguments that I recall from that period was that uh, each of uh, Ronald Wilson Reagan's uh, three names uh, has six letters, so you, you get 666 embedded right there uh, in his name. 
there's an element of a parlor game to uh, some of these sorts of speculations. There is an entertainment value, and there's often entertainment value with regard to evil and destruction uh, that's more powerful than with regard to good and peace and, uh, and the like. During the Cold War, many in the West saw the Soviet Union as an agent of the Antichrist. After its empire dissolved, some began to look at the U.S. and its role as sole superpower. But many see the American empire as beginning to manifest all the characteristics of the Antichrist. Coercive power, controlling power, unilateral power. Most of the church does not live in the United States, so many Christians are finding themselves, they would say, being oppressed by the American empire. But Antichrist fervor isn't confined to America. It's certainly true that Muslims have used the word Antichrist as justification for killing Christians and vice versa. And both Muslims and Christians have used the term as a way of maligning Jews. Uh, so there's, there's no dearth of evidence of how this term has been misused. Though the Antichrist label has been applied to the powerful and the powerless, emperors and their empires, most prophecy believers still seek an Antichrist to come, a solitary, charismatic individual who signals the worst of times, the tribulation, and the best of times, the millennium. But what is the origin of the Antichrist's profile and the details of his agenda? Surprisingly, many of the most popular end times ideas in America today are rooted in the 19th century and come from the mind of an influential British evangelist. Believers vanish into thin air. A beguiling Antichrist promises peace, but instead persecutes those left behind.